This is a sample CAD drawing of a bolted connection where I have a bolt that is clamping a steel plate to a cast iron plate. And you'll notice that I have the head of the bolt, I have a washer, I have the upper plate, the lower plate, a washer, and a nut. But if we now tighten this nut on this bolt, we're going to subject these plates and the lower and upper washers to compression. And at the same time, we are going to be subjecting the bolt between this head and the nut. We're going to be subjecting that bolt to tension. We want to sort out what the stress distribution is going to look like and what the contact pressure will look like at the interface of these plates. I'm interested in what the stress state looks like in the clamp plate. So for simplicity, I have removed the bolt and all I'm left with are the washers, the upper and the lower plate as shown here. After loading the plate, I run a finite element analysis. I remove the bolt and I section the plate so I get a notion of what the stress distribution looks like inside the plate. And if I do that, I get something that looks like this. And we get some stress that spreads out as we move away from the point of application of the load. So load is applied at the top side and at the bottom side by tightening the nut on the bolt, which puts the bolt into tension and applies compressive loads on the washers at both the top and the bottom. If we change the scale of the stresses, you get a very clear notion of how the stresses spread out below the washer on each side. Now it's a little complicated because we have two different materials and an interface between two different materials. But nonetheless, you'll notice this spreading out. So the stress, the average stress is getting smaller as we move down to the center. Our goal is to come up with an approach for modeling the stress distribution in the clamp plates. And that's what we will do next. The other thing I'm going to do once I've got an FEA is I'm going to create a slice plane so that I can cut down through and observe what is happening at the interface between these clamp plates. And if I do that and look at that interface, I get to see a stress distribution that's created by clamping these plates together. And you will notice that the stress distribution is highest in the vicinity of the bolt hole and then it falls off as we move away from the bolt hole, actually falling off to zero. And so the pressure distribution at the interface between clamp plates will vary as you move from one bowl to another. And if you have a gasketed joint and you want to control the pressure in that gasketed joint, there will be rules of thumb that you will apply so that you can assure you have sufficient clamping pressure at the interface so that a gasket will not leak under the applied loads. Now that we understand the basic mechanics of power screws, we're ready to begin our discussion of bolts. We're going to focus our attention on hexagonal headed bolts because they're the most commonly used for engineering structures. And I want to point out a few things about these bolts. The first is that standard dimensions for bolts are included in the appendix. This is a hexagonal head bolt. And you will notice that this bolt has a head height, capital H, which is given right here. And it has an overall length that goes from the end of the bolt to the washer face and it's called capital L and then there is a threaded length. Sometimes bolts are fully threaded but oftentimes they are not fully threaded so we need to consider both the overall length of the bolt and the threaded length of the bolt. The other important thing is that there is a fillet radius which controls the stress concentration at the transition from the shank up to the head of the bolt. This is an example of a washer faced bolt that is designed to have a washer that fits around the top of that bolt. That washer then protects the fillet radius from the hole that you insert the bolt through. Now the washer face has a diameter capital W that is one and a half times the nominal diameter. So the nominal diameter is the diameter at the top of the threads and is also the diameter associated with the unthreaded shank of the bolt. So there is a very specific thread length. When we talk about an overall length of a bolt, capital L, there is a thread length in both the English and metric system that is standard for various bolts. The threaded length for a bolt of length L that is less than six inches is twice the diameter plus a quarter inch. And if that overall length is greater than six inches, the threaded length is twice the diameter plus a half inch. For metric, we have three different length categories. 
all of which peg the thread length at twice the diameter plus an offset. That is important as we move forward in estimating the overall spring stiffness of the bolts. The nuts that fit on the bottom of the bolts are described in Appendix A31 in the back of the Shigley textbook. We already discussed when we mentioned power screws that the first three threads carry the majority of the load and it is often the case that local plastic deformation occurs in the first thread. And so this is an important point. Nuts should not be reused in critical applications. This is just showing a number of different nut designs. Don't worry too much about that because it doesn't affect the mechanics of a joint. Now, the next concept that we have to introduce is something called the grip length. It is this lowercase script L over here, and it is the length of all the components that are compressed by a bolt that is preloaded. So if I have this bolt and I put a nut on the bolt and then I tighten that nut, that nut advances up the threads according to the pitch and the lead and that then puts the bolt into tension. So if you were looking at the bolt, you would be developing tension in the bolt, pressing the washer, this bottom plate, this top plate, and the top washer as well. If, instead of a nut on the bottom of the bolt, we thread our bolt into a threaded plate, then the overall grip length is not equal to the total thickness of the washer, the top plate, and the bottom plate, but instead it only passes through a fraction of the bottom plate, and that's because the first three threads are carrying the majority of the load. So we have to figure out exactly the depth to which we have load transfer in the plate. The effective grip length for tapped holes, so this is showing a bolt, a washer-faced bolt has a washer underneath it. It is clamping a top plate of thickness T1 to a bottom plate of thickness T2 using a bolt with a nominal diameter of D. And we have to sort out what the grip length happens to be. So the grip length is the length of all of the compressed components and the way we decide upon the grip length for a threaded plate, so in this case, this threaded plate is in here, and we are bolting this top plate to this threaded plate. The grip length is going to be equal to H, which is the thickness of the washer and the top plate, plus half of the thickness T2 if the thickness T2 is less than the bolt diameter. Otherwise, the grip length is equal to H plus half the bolt diameter. So what you do is you imagine drawing a radius about this point and the depth of the grip can only go at most to half of the bolt diameter. When you preload a bolt member system and then we apply load to that member, it's natural to ask what the heck is the load in the bolt. So during the preloading phase, before we apply this load P, the bolt is stretched and the members are compressed. When the external load P is applied, the bolt stretches a little bit further and members in the grip lose some of their compression. So we want to model this system as a system of springs. And so we're going to put model the bolt as an equivalent spring that is stretching. And we want to model the member as an equivalent spring that is compressing. So we need to find a bolt spring constant and we need to find a member spring constant in order to do this calculation. But before we do that, we have to talk a little bit about equivalent stiffness. So if we have a rod, a circular rod of cross section A, and I load that with a force P, you know that under the influence of that force, the rod will stretch by some amount, let's say delta. And what we want to know is how is the load P related to delta? Well, it's related to delta through the stiffness of the rod. If the rod is of original length L, you know that I could easily write this as a stress relationship where I take the load, I divide it by the cross-sectional area. That would be equal to the elastic modulus of this rod material times the strain. What is the strain? The strain is just going to be equal to delta over L. So I have an elastic modulus times delta over L. Now I'm seeing delta here. So I'm going to go ahead and solve for the load 
load P, it's going to be equal to AE over L times delta. So the equivalent stiffness of this rod is just going to be equal to AE over L. So it depends upon the cross-sectional area A, the elastic modulus of the material, and the length of the material. So if we have a bolt and a member, we have to think about the fact that the nominal area is different, I'll call that A sub D, than the threaded area. Ay, ay. So now we got the problem of we have to identify the grip and we need to know the length of the bolt inside the grip, some of which is going to be unthreaded and some of which is going to be threaded. So what we need to do next is then think about the fact that we will model the bolt as a set of two springs where KT is the spring constant of the threaded length of the bolt, and K, I'll call it KU, is a spring constant of the unthreaded length of the bolt. Well, let's make life simpler. Let's just call this K1 and K2. And now I have a question for you. If I load this with some force F, and this thing stretches by some amount delta, what is the equivalent spring constant. The total deformation, I'll call this, give this a special name delta T, is going to be equal to the amount of deformation that is in spring one plus the amount of stretch that is in spring two. Now because these two springs are in series, they both experience the same force. So we know that the force is going to be equal to K1 delta one, which is going to be equal to K2 delta two. If we solve for those deltas, we get that the total deformation is going to be equal to F over K1 plus F over K2. Equivalent spring constant is going to be equal to F over F times 1 over K1 plus 1 over K2. Get rid of those Fs and we find that 1 over the equivalent spring constant is equal to 1 over K1 plus 1 over K2. It's how we find equivalent spring constants for two springs in series. If if we have five springs, then one over K equivalent is equal to the sum of I equal one to five of one over K I. So life is pretty simple if we can figure out what the equivalent spring constants are. And that's our task when it comes to bolted members.